wait, so you brought that up earlier when we were talking about, uh, is it a luxury to have, um, oh, to not these, think. to not think. And so I guess, Giving? I guess that was just sort of spinning off of like, uh, that there's this animal reality <laughs> beneath the surface at yes. all times. At all and times. That, oh yeah. man. Oh yeah. dude. It will. Why? And then I guess, you know, when Nietzsche and certain thinkers suggest forgetting, it really makes sense in that. I don't know, you know, does it, how often does it do us good? And I guess this goes back to knowledge should serve us. History should serve us, you know, and if they don't, again, it's, what is it? It's dead weight or it's almost like a malignancy. Yeah, like what is history that ignores that state of nature that we've been talking about that still sort of lives in you to some extent? It's, I, I don't know, because I guess something like that, my thoughts are, well, it's fiction. It's, and it's okay to have fiction and art to a degree, but at the same time, okay, I guess we're back to art. Like your art is actually your more, like it really is morality. And I guess if I think of modern art, actually here's something I did want to talk about with you was America as, as a televisual culture and also how our art has changed over time, you know? And if, if we, if we go back to the postmodernists who their expression was to, and they, they, these aren't even my words. I, I reckon I would recommend you or anyone to read that, that essay, uh, E Unibus Plurum. Okay. Uh, right, because it's just, it's a certain under, it, it's an understanding that I never saw anyone else ever express, and I only saw it in that one place, so it's like, I always say, hey, if you haven't read this, it's definitely worth it. But he talks about what the postmodern thinkers began to understand is actually, the more connectivity, the more chaos. The, the more you have a rise in complexity, and the more nodes therein further network to other nodes, it's like, dude, that is all the, each new path is a chance for disruption. Each new path is a chance for something to go wrong. And it's, it's the same in wiring in your car and a tank and a, in a plane, right? And luckily, we are amazing at complexity, but complexity also requires diffusion of action and responsibility, you know, and you, you, without, you know, well, I guess we could define responsibility, we could question responsibility, we could say how but many people... I think people... I get what you're driving at. You're, talking, you're asking about modern art because this is in a time, the illusion is falling mm -hmm. of the previous enchantment of the world, which was Christianity-based. Right. Our morality and our art. And there. now art ha is unrestrained yes. to some extent. And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's like, okay, here's your art. It's a malignancy. You know, it's just a cancer and we're just going to stare at it. <laughs> and, and I know, okay, as a modern example, you know, if I think of the pop surrealist movement, it's fundamentally, it's Mickey Mouse in a gas mask, right? Mm -hmm. That's our world, right? It's, it's, you have the cute side well, of, I look, of, it, a mouse isn't a prey animal, he's a cartoon, and then right. he's wearing a gas mask because he might get some mustard. <laughs> I don't know. Right, 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 right. He might get some fire behind the trenches, I guess. Yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, the cartoon world and cartoon physics, that's... An interesting thing, the psychology of which I haven't really thought about. But uh, the I'm a big fan of cartoons, by the way. I, I guess, um, what would I say? When I think about American culture now, sure. and thinking about what the, I don't know, the utter privation that we have of culture in America, mm -hmm. um, I think of every single streaming, new streaming show, <laughs> yeah. streaming movie, being essentially the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. This carbon copy blueprint of some hero cycle story with all of the pathos stripped out of it, with unlikable anti-hero, anti-social characters oh, who are plotting against each cynicism, other. Cynicism, flatness, numbness, right. it's all there. Tons of violence and sexuality. Well, that's our greatest and, exploits and as Americans. And amazing visual effects. Yes. And uh, usually halfway decent plotting, but sometimes, because these are all made by committee and it's not the single artistic yes. vision of somebody, usually yes. there's like something weird in the pacing or yeah, character. Yeah, and you, you can like, tell, oh, that off. got cut, that got yeah. cut, that got changed last right. minute. That but, that messed up, that just didn't work but out. But overall, like movie. when I like think about like, okay, you look at like the soundtrack and the aesthetic and right. the general overall um, plot points that you're going to hit, and like every new like sci-fi adventure streaming show, like all our right. new stories that are becoming most popular right now, especially over the past two years, mm -hmm. shit that can just be beamed into your home and is not coming out in a theater. Right. I'm just like, when I look at that, that's what I think of rather than any particular art movement because it's like the most commercially viable right. art we, that's being well, done. We're televisual, back to the point, like we are a televisual culture and that mm -hmm. hasn't changed. Now the craziest thing about that essay, Unibus Plurum, it was pre-internet or it was pre-everyone using internet because it was early written in the early 90s. And so 
he actually he 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 cites a conservative tech writer and the conservative tech writer's vision is like no look once we all get to curate our bits of data mm-hmm. and once we're not beholden to televisual broadcast and the manipulation of these broadcasters everything you know things will be solved the problems will be fixed and you know people will be happier and better and you could say yes it provides a certain opportunity but you have to be savvy and intelligent enough to t- capitalize on it on it one and then two is that he predicted it because he said again once more the increase in connectivity is an increase in chaos. The postmodern mm. understanding was the more connected nodes and connectivity in general, I guess, is the harder it is to make anything of the signal. Because if we're broadcasting this at all times, you know, you see how much, I guess, well, how much it's affected Americans, how much it affects the world. And now, and now we all have access to it and you can question, okay, you could say, is it a good thing or is it a bad thing? And you could make strong, you know, and I guess we go back to Plato and Plato would say, this was, this is all a bad, I think oh, yeah. Plato would be very if upset. If you read the Republic, it's very yes. clear what oh, he thinks. People would be very upset. But, but this is, so what you're seeing is like, uh, so again, the illusion falls, we're confronting material reality. Yes. And there's a million ideas now. And this is a consequence of the, what you would call the decadence or the decline. Yeah. It, uh, it's the basically, change over time, yeah. Yeah. Uh, all ideas can now come out and come to the forefront because right. we need, or we are in need of ideas. Right. Basically. No, no, we, we are. We, but we that's the what, stimulation and the, uh, it heightens the ratio of noise to signal or, yes. or, I mean, that's the thing. I would say there's probably a thousand great signals that you could jump oh, on yeah. today. But, but all the other signals them. sound like noise when they're just all going in concert, right. you know. And then, well, again, it's a question of finding them because, I mean, I mean, look, the Nietzsche podcast has been awesome. Like, I, I Thanks, like... Well, and I love yeah, all the no, shit on Into the Absurd. Yeah, like, and, oh, sure, thank you. Uh, but no, I mean, congratulations on the success and seriousness, but also that, um, what do you call it? Like, again, uh, I don't want to say Keegan is an educator, but a little, right, right? Like, like, like <laughs> let's give credit where credit's due. And I just, I know, I, I, I think it's, it's great that, again, this is my thought is, you know, we, we always need educators. It's important. Mm -hmm. And you know, that to even say it, like there's a part in me that wants to be cynical about that statement in the sense of, well, if none of this matters to the degree that this is a cyclical process and there's nothing anyone can do about it. And that our art itself might be, you know, that is a, maybe it is our only answer to it is that this is all we can do. This is all we can produce in the face of it. You know, I mean, what, like no single person can solve this. No president could solve this. No, you know, the, the changes over time, the, you know, whether regardless of value judgments of good and bad, it's like, it's affected us. It's affected our people. It's affected the whole world. Cause I guess look, uh, America is a televisual culture, right? Mm-hmm. Like I've heard from countless Europeans, how much they resent actually the sway of America, like how much America has influenced their country and their countrymen oh, yeah. over, you know, and they're going like, they're like, Hey, look, here I am talking like an American. I've never been to America. I've just watched a lot of your media. I don't even like it that I'm using your words. You know, yeah. and I try not to, and I understand it too. I go, okay, yeah. I don't want to do it either. You know, I try and, uh, I guess go back to that, you know, kind well, of timeless But that's space. what's kind of horrifying about it too. Now with the level of interconnectivity with the internet is that there's nothing safe <laughs> there's no we don't have individual distinct cultures anymore like or to the extent that they exist it's like if you imagine like the barrier or like the membrane of a cell yes it's like they're slowly getting like dissolved by alcohol or whatever right, right. And the alcohol is capitalism but like global <laughs> capitalism <laughs> but you know what I'm saying like well, it's basically that's yeah. what I mean it really is like a profit uh, creating capital efficiency that's driving people into every market on the globe right and like, did why, we did we really need to be this uh, efficient and crazy about efficiency? You know well, I mean? like, and that's what I, guess so. I mean. Honestly, that's what does the that logic. Have, I, that's, say, that's the logic that produces superficial art, though. Is right. that the, the logic of making something appeal to the greatest number of people possible? Right. And then things like what you and I are talking about, like, <laughs> like you know, some sort of like timeless arc archetype of the artist revealing his truth for these future generations <laughs> that makes it sound like romantic asshole fall, in spite of the cyclical <laughs> fall of empires no i mean I, that's fine dude that, that's was that was a cynical comment because but, but, no no yeah I, no, maybe, maybe, it was makes that, it sound like romantic assholes that's like how people think now. no i know i know that's and they're why, like the, like the, the, ir- the irony fucking we don't need it on, we, on, we don't need twitter it. 
Uh, that's how they think is like well, denigrate anything okay. like that. And it gets in our heads. And I think of it, I yeah. think that as well too. It's almost like, a re- no, it's a release valve. But here's the thing. If that release valve is open all the time, you're like left with a right. vacuum. Almost. No, you're right. Your release valve is a perfect way to put it because like, it's okay. It's okay. Skepticism, irony. That's, it has yeah, a place. It's got a it, place. Nietzsche says irony is best in education where the teacher lets the student make a mistake to right. point out to him what he doesn't know. That's mm-hmm. irony's application in education. Amongst friends, it's, it's fine for humor provided right, I guess right, right. everyone's on the same level and it's like you know I don't know that like I think me and you could be I we, you know we, we and I guess we, we, we have been you know we've been ironic we've been cynical right, right, right. but it's all been in good humor yeah, of I'm like I would never all the no time. and I would never dude if someone was in serious help or if someone was in serious need especially someone I loved I would never fucking like that would I would never like to me if they're like if that's your response to someone in need it's like that's not a life raft like that's just a foot kicking them adrift right, you know right, like right. Uh, it has again it has its place uh so what david foster wallace wrote of the televisual culture of the 90s was that the televisual culture of previous america uh it actually arose as competing with the postmodern art scene because they saw that you know this understanding was that humanity was becoming increasingly aware of its status as a kind of blind mindless consumer amidst countless other consumers who blindly consume and then he cites examples like alf you know the alien in that old show from way back when right of saying like hey come um what do you call it uh stuff your face with food and watch tv tonight right inviting you know and is is a passive viewer that's got to make you feel like shit or even what is is it the circle jerks tv party tonight we've got nothing better to do than Mm -hmm. have some drinks and watch the tube or whatever the lyrics are right and that was american culture it was that cynicism that flatness and that numbness and he brought up the commercials from the 90s if you remember and you've you've seen them since of like here's some people in black and white and then one of them drinks sprite and all of a sudden he's in color right Mm -hmm. here's your transcendent transcendental individualism so he said (laughs) it was something like flatness like like the the cynicism is an, is an an is an answer to like one aspect of it the numbness lets everyone know that you're not naive and that the you know like he he right. lays out what the what each well, function they serve okay wait let me jump in here sure. because my what i go to this is so funny that we're going to i'm i'm about to drop the topic i'm about to drop sure. the nietzsche podcast but um what i think of with what you're talking about is seinfeld because that is the ultimate nihilistic show yes. it's literally a show about nothing yes all of the Bingo. characters are terrible people. Right. And, and what do they do? Endure each other? Endure their, ex- their, their pointless existence? Like, I mean, basically, kind of, right? but they endure it through being cynical and ironic and yes. sarcastic and assholes and, like, <laughs> relishing in that yes. and being smarter than And every, the show like, knows it. And the yes. show addresses it. And, and they, they know that's like why you're ball. watching it and that's why they had the rule, no hugging, no learning. What were the two rules yes. of the writing staff? Was that the Larry David? Did Larry David yeah. put that forward? That the characters can't, like, there's not going to be an awe. Like, the audience, the studio audience isn't going to say awe right. while they hug. And they're never going to learn a lesson or grow as people. Which most TV characters <laughs> never learn a lesson or grow correctly. as people anyway. People who didn't it understand. Ended, people who, note, yeah, and people, yeah. people who didn't understand that ending, I think, like, like I think it ended correctly. Like, it ended mm. how that show should have ended. Like, look, they're irredeemable you're gonna get assholes. Me canceled, dude. And they get, oh, I can't <laughs> believe you're saying this. <laughs> what, <laughs> that, that Seinfeld ended correctly? Yeah, that's uh, that, out of everything that's going to upset people. Yeah, take well, on this podcast. I, okay, how would you, where, where, where are you at in, in this, in this age old topic? Show, <laughs> age old topic. It, uh, I actually am probably closer to your view. Yeah, it's hard to. I don't think it was a particularly good ending no yeah i'll agree with you there it was like the worst thing ever like the sopranos ending was the worst thing ever yes i'll agree with you there Uh, too seinfeld was like dude i mean we got to see a lot of the characters again they go testify against them honestly i actually like that you're you're right i like that conceit of all the characters they've wronged over the years come and testify against them and then they go to jail and jerry and george literally have the same conversation that they have from the pilot episode about and they did that on purpose so they didn't learn anything (laughs) It's like everyone they've wronged tells them how they wronged them, and then they didn't learn anything. And so you're right; that is actually the perfect ending to Seinfeld in, the, in right. some way. And maybe, and maybe because to the degree that we're all assholes, we don't want to admit it. I don't know. I don't know what it is. Right? Well, yeah, it's that's, coherent that's with the message of the yes. show. Yes. But well the, well, the reason why I brought it up though is because sure. Seinfeld, in my opinion, <laughs> is a great work of art. Yeah, like that to me is like the <laughs> the archetype of cynical, witty, ironic sitcoms. Right. 
but it's it's not what have they changed like what but it's not through shitty art that you get a complete degradation of art right? right it's it's by somebody coming along and being i mean what's the the prime example in music is nirvana nirvana comes along they change the game and then everyone's like fuck i hate all these nirvana clones why is everyone trying to sound like nirvana and that's like the same thing i guess like why i thought of seinfeld i'm like there are amazing examples of exactly what you described right. but then getting inundated well, with nirvana that is like no nirvana is a great example of and to a certain degree, to the degree that nihilistic all, too, the, and the, also the nineties. The, the nineties musicians, well, I shit, I think of the eels, Novocaine for the soul, right? Like, mm. give me something to fill the hole before I sputter out. Like, there's so many lyrics and bands I could name from the nineties where some of it, some of it was some of that kind of transcendental. What do you call it? Um, like uh, being a transcendental individual. It's like, well, if we're cynical enough, if we're flat enough, if we're this enough, right. maybe. If you're cynical enough, you're like standing outside of your age a little bit and you get some freedom and independence of yes. thought. And so there's that freedom there. Right. And it's like, and where does that even come from? It's like, well, yeah, I guess you could, you could say maybe we trace that lineage to that notion of Americans as both individualists, yet for being individualists, we have quite the tendency to loving cults and collectivism. You know, it's kind of this shit ebb and flow. And you Everyone know, made fun of the Goths in high school for being individualistic in uh, their conformity. You ever seen the guy? The, you, what about the Goths, Goths on South Park? You, 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 oh, yeah, the, yeah, oh, yeah, they're, yeah. They're the best. He's like, he's like, hey, I thought we were nihilistic. No, we're, we're pessimistic. No, I don't, <laughs> right. They don't even know what they are, but they're just right. they're trying to figure it out themselves. But it's like being a cynic or being a pessimist or being having that detached, ironic coolness is a way to insert your individuality, like which is valuable in right. and of itself, even though... You can say, okay, well, a million people asserted their individuality in the same way, and then that's where it became... Yes, like, we're, we're watching... He uses the example of a story about David does in, in the Union of his plurum. David Foster Wallace? Yeah. Okay. And he uses the example of... There's the, the, the short story, I forget who wrote it, uh, some famous postmodern writer, right? But it was, um, you know, we're going to see the world's most photographed barn... And the premise is, you know, like this barn, like what did it look like before it was photographed? Now we're part of the zeitgeist of this thing. And does anyone like, you know, we're taking pictures of taking pictures of ideas of ideas, you know, mm-hmm. that by the time you're there, you know, the whole thing is him quest- questioning just what are they achieving and doing of, hey, we're now we're here at what we've been advertised to as the most photographed barn photographing the barn like whose idea even was this and Mm -hmm. you know it really starts to get weird if you really think about you know i don't know uh, so what that makes me think of is something maybe a little weird but uh it makes what it makes me think of is uh so i went to europe when i was like 19 Mm -hmm. and i went alone and i just backpacked i met a bunch of people i would travel with people for like a week at a time but mostly i was on my own uh and i was just taking the bus i had a bus pass it was this one bus route that went in one fucking direction one cycle so it was easy just went from place to place. They could even drop you off at your hostel. Great. Uh, it was Australian bus line, so I met a ton of Australian people. But I remember I went to a ton of museums because that's the thing you fucking do. Right. And by like halfway through, I was like, I'm done. It was after Rome. I was like, I'm done with museums. <laughs> Too many. Because I had been, been to like in Rome. I was like, okay, I've seen enough. I've seen enough history. And I'm going to like south of France and Spain now. I'm just going to indulge and not care about any of that and so then when i got back to paris which is where i was spending the last week i was like all right i gotta go see the louvre and the mona lisa it's been long enough and i was like i've been running to so many people who saw the mona lisa and they're like it's so small it's like a freaking <laughs> they're like they're like it's the most <laughs> underwhelming shit you will ever see in because... your life because you were a part of this movement that swept you along towards it. And well, once you get there... Right. But that, So that's the thing. So I heard... <laughs> Excuse me. I was cynical about museums. And then I heard for like two or three or four weeks, everybody say the Mona Lisa is the most underwhelming, horrible thing ever. And then when I went to the uh, the museum, the Mona Lisa was probably my favorite thing I saw. I was just because saying, my expectations had been so low Lord. that when I saw it, I was like... That is a gorgeous painting in ways I never thought about before. That's cool. And it's not that small. It is pretty freaking small. But I was like, it's not that. It's not a postcard. Like, <laughs> I had been prepared for, like, it's like you got to get a microscope, basically. But so, I don't know where I was going with that. It was basically just well, that the the being underwhelmed, or told I was going to be underwhelmed, actually, like, whelmed me <laughs> when right. I saw it. Well, I was going to say, I think, you know, what's, without, without, if I could like tr- even try to remove myself from any of this, which I can't, and I would say, okay, to me, in theory, the coolest thing about seeing that would be to think about Leonardo da Vinci 
to go, this is the closest I will probably ever get to him, right? Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, maybe as relatives, I don't know, right? right? But, you know, in terms of... Well, I was 19, so I didn't think about that at all. Yeah, okay, it, right. It, well, well, dude, okay. Yeah. Maybe that's a topic we can talk about <laughs> is, okay, the male brain at age 19. Now. I would think yes. about it now, but 19, yeah. Well, dude, absolutely. I mean, and that's, that's a spooky thing about culture, too, of for how much we talk, okay, whether we're depositing new ideals, old ideals, new art, or new morality, or whatever it may be, how much of it is just a, a, a limited capacity of, what do you call it, I guess, with it, is it like the, would you call it like the limited capacity load or like what's actually the limiting factors? I guess that's okay. what it is. The limiting factors of human production are that, well, when we're young, we're pretty ignorant and stupid. Is that, that's not hyperbole, is it? That's not no. insulting, is it? Like that's honest, I think. No, we're very stupid. Right, right, very ignorant. You know, you don't like. When I, I think s- about myself from 10 or even five years ago, yeah, especially five years ago. <laughs> yeah. Like, dumbass. Yeah, kind of. And, and then I think I do but, have this But that's not even that long, but that's nothing. Five right, years, and I think about, like, well, that. in five years, I'm going to think of myself now as a dumbass. I would so. hope. And maybe maybe, maybe in the, you know, back to, if we kick it back to Nietzsche, like, the whole, you know, his sentiments between Schopenhauer's educator to Eke Homo of, like, I, you know, he said one of the things that disappoint him, disappoints him the most is that, uh, he inevitably sees that philosophers contradict themselves mm-hmm. and it's like okay are they actually contradicting themselves or just is it their minds changing over time because they're taking in new information you know what I mean like yeah, what a, I guess what a allegation Nietzsche if you enjoyed the Nietzsche podcast or found it helpful you can visit us and support the show at patreon.com slash untimely reflections the link is in the description or just share the show with any of your friends that you think might enjoy it or on social media Thank you for your support.